Finesse Creativers presents a word for every generation that knows no fashion. A hope and trust. I find you all, my dear friends. We are on the old time religion series and we are building on the mountaintop experience series. This morning, we want to go and look at the book of 1 Kings. We are still at chapter 18. We'll continue reading from verse 26 and work our way to verse number 30. Now, I want us to consider the sermon title, Dancing for God. Come with me to the book of Kings, and verse 26 provides as follows in the Home and Bible. So they took the bull that he gave them, prepared it, and called on the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, Baal, answer us. But there was no sound. No one answered. Then they danced, hobbling around the altar they had made. At noon, Elijah mocked them and he said, Call loudly for he is a God. Maybe he is thinking it over. Maybe he has wandered away. Or maybe he is on the road. Perhaps he is sleeping and will wake up. They shouted loudly and cut themselves with knives and spears according to their custom until blood gushed over them. All afternoon, they kept on raving until the offering of the evening sacrifice. But there was no sound. No one answered. No one paid attention. Then Elijah said to the people, Come near me. So all the people approached him. Then he repaired the old Lord's altar that he had been torn down. I want to take this one again. Then Elijah said to the people, Come near me. So all the people approached him. Then he repaired the Lord's altar that had been torn down. Let us take time to pray and make use of this altar of prayer. Kind of gracious Father in the heavens above, the altar of prayer has been torn down. Some of us have begun to dance around this altar, and yet, O oh Father, yet, O oh Father, you are a God who hears and you answer. Your ear is ever trained to listen to our prayers. Therefore, we approach your throne with confidence through the ministry of prayer. Dear Lord, may you revive us. Dear Lord, may you answer our petitions, not with fire, but in the affirmative. Some of us are not well. Heal us. Some of us are seeking employment provided upon us. Some of us are seeking social relations, marriages. We're seeking reconnection to our families. May you bless us in that sphere as well. But all of us together will long for and look forward to your second coming. Please prepare us for that day. May it find us ready for you to have made us so. In Jesus' name, we pray for all these favors. Amen. My good friends, as the custom is, why don't we raise our five points and go into the weekend. I want you to notice there are three levels of ungodly worship. We are not going to be looking at uh, ungodly worship, but we can't avoid it. It is in the passage of scripture. As we go into the old time religion, we cannot help but draw a comparison of these two types of religions. And at number one, what I want you to notice is that the prophets of Baal went on an appeal. They called upon Baal. When Baal did not respond, what is the next thing they did? The Bible says they went on to dance and hobble around the altar. Why are they dancing and hobbling around the altar? It is as a means of attracting their God. It is as a means of endearment to God. And so as a result, to make sure that they ingratiate themselves to this foreign God, they go on to dance. And the third level. You're going to find this where now they are cutting themselves with knives and spears. It is still a part of ingratiating themselves to the gods. And how are they intending to do this? To prove their dedication to the gods. To evoke pity from the gods. To say, look how we are dedicated to this cause. And when they do so, they hope that by so doing, they will draw nigh unto their god. Are we not pulling from this leaf as well? Have we not begun to dance in the, in, in, in the pretext 
are, are under the auspices of praising God, but we are also seeking just to attract God, to endear ourselves. And some of us are even gyrating in dance and in our forms of dancing. And you wonder, and you wonder, is there anything holy about this dance? What is holy about this dance? And what does it achieve as far as God is concerned? And I want to take you back to the old time religion. And I'm in the book of Kings. Chapter 18 is instructive on how we ought to call upon the Lord and how we ought to worship him. We ought to be different from the prophets of Baal. They have gone through the process. They have prayed. They have danced. They have cut themselves. But how will Elijah go about this? That is instructive. It is instructive. At point number two, here's the other thing that I also want you to take note of. Elijah goes on to mock these prophets. As he mocks them, let us not look at uh, the sense of humor that is there, the twisted sense of humor maybe. But I want us to look at the lessons, the lessons that we can draw from Elijah's mockery. There are lessons for our time. Number one, he says, you know what? Maybe Baal, Baal, he is thinking it over. Baal is suffering from an indecision that we looked at. If you haven't checked out our devotional from last Monday, please do so. From last Wednesday, please do so. Paralysis from overanalysis or paralysis or as, a regard, as regards to ignorance. But he says maybe he is still thinking it over. He is a God who does not think fast. He has a problem coming to the right decisions. But why should you operate a God who does not think better than you do? A God who cannot give you an answer from morning up to noon. Your God like that is not worth worshipping. This is what Elijah is saying. If you are thinking better than your God, you have no business worshipping that God. You just have to change gods immediately. The old time religion says, come to a God who will ask you, were you there, Job? When I created the heavens, were you there when I measured the breadth? There is the length, the diameter of the entire universe with my span of hands. Were you there? This is a God who's worth worshipping and Elijah draws our attention to this God. Were you there? God must definitely be better than us in all aspects. That's what makes him God. Being better than us, he moves on. And number point two B, he has wandered away. You know, a God who is a God of no fixed abode, a God who is a vagabond, not a tourist, wandered away. A God who cannot find his way back is not a God to be worshipped. And this is the God who when he presents himself again in the book of Job and he is asked, where are you coming from? He says, I have been going up and down, wide and along the breadth of the earth. He is a wandering God. Until God then asks, have you considered my servant Job? A God who's wandering is a God who does not pay attention to detail. That is the devil. And now he wants us to think about this and make in a note in our minds, a footnote. How different then is Yahweh? Yahweh is a God of fixed abode. He says, I have residence. I do not wonder. My residence is in heaven and earth is my footstool. I reside and operate from heaven. That is the God we serve. That is the God of the old time religion. And he says at point number two C, he is on the road. Now it was believed back in the time that the gods will travel and visit other galaxies. Those of you who watch movies, you are going to remember there is the part uh, when you watch one of those movies where there is Thor and I Idris Elba actually is the one who mans the gate between the galaxies so that the gods can travel between galaxies. If you are, you know, into those movies, I'm sure you get the idea. But when you come to God, when you come to Yahweh, God does not need to travel. He is the omnipresent God. When he is with Moses, he says, Moses, while we are talking, you and I, your people down there are gone worshipping the idol. They could not wait to apostatize, go out and deal with them. He is the God, and Jesus Christ says this in the New Testament, I am the only one who has come from heaven and come to earth. And even though I've come to earth, I am still in heaven. I never left heaven. He is the omnipresent God. The old time religion 
is the religion of worshiping a God who is omnipresent. At point number 2D, he says, one more, more, carry. Maybe he is sleeping. He is sleeping. When he is sleeping, let's hope he will wake up when you make so much noise. And this is a God who is either fatigued or he's a God who is lazy. David has this to say. He says, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My, my help cometh from the Lord. Why does it come from the Lord? Because he will not slumber and neither will he sleep. And Jesus, as is recorded by John the Beloved, he says, my father is ever working. We are talking about a God who is not lazy. We are talking about the creator, not the created. He sets everything in place and it exists because he is why he holds it in place. God who is working. So as Elijah goes on to this mockery, I want you to take note. It is not just a joke for you to laugh and say he got them. He got them. He gave them a good hiding and he put them at their place. No, it's a learning moment for you and I. Number one, God is a fast thinker. God thinks ahead of us. Number two, God does not wander away. He has a fixed abode. Number three, God does not need to get onto the road. He is omnipresent. Before he goes, he's already there. Before he comes back, he has arrived. That is the God we serve. He is never a sleeping or tired God. He is ever working and ever working God. At point number three, here's the other thing that I want to raise as we come to the end. The religion of Yahweh has been defined through the times by worship times. It had a single day of worship and times of sacrifice. There was the morning sacrifice and the evening sacrifice. The Bible does make clear on that. And its altar had been torn down. And though it was still visible, the worship of the true God had been torn down. And even then, we are on a mission to repair the altar of the worship of the true God. Those who are at Mount Carmel, they help us to appreciate this. They help us to appreciate this. Those who were the worshippers of Baal, when they came up to the, I mean, to the top of the mountain, they are the ones who tore it down. Either physically tore it down, or it was torn down because it was disused. Out of disuse, it became uh, almost non-functional. And because of that, this particular altar becomes torn down. And I want you to notice this. It would appear the prophets of Baal did not have an altar. They only built an altar at the instruction of Elijah. The worshippers of other gods, they do not care whether there is an altar or not. As long as the altar of God is not there, they are fine. They do not have to come up with their own altar. But during that day, two altars had to be erected. As these altars were erected, here's one thing that I find interesting. This altar that is set up is an altar for the worship of God. It has been torn down. And I want to ask you this question. Is the altar of prayer still up in your home? Is the altar of prayer still up in your life? Is the altar of prayer still burning in your life? The old time religion says, Come and observe that there are times to worship the Lord. Have you spent time in the Lord? Have you taken time to talk to God? When you do not do so, your altar runs out. Your altar dies out. Your altar becomes dilapidated. Your altar is never in use. The old time religion simply says, revive your altar. Repair your altar. This is the reason of going up to Mount Carmel, so that altars may be repaired. This is the very reason of sharing this devotional, so that the altars may be revived, may be revived. Until we meet again on Monday morning. Take time to hear how Elijah concludes the matter at Carmel. Until we meet again, blessings and peace.